Yeah. Are you? Come <laughs> in here late. Okay, we're going to get started with lecture in a second here. Okay, uh, if, before we begin, if anyone wants to come up closer, uh, take the chance to do it now. Um, we will be coding, so the, I'm thinking the furthest table back, it might be a little bit hard to see, but we'll see. Hey, just want to check in with you guys in Calgary. We're just starting up now. And let me know if the audio is coming in clear for you guys. Or if it needs a little tweaking on your end. Hopefully you guys are joining us this morning and not, as far as I know, Hafiz is not doing a lecture with you guys. Okay, I'm still waiting on you guys, Calgary. Um, let me know if you come in. I'm just going to double check. Uh, do you guys know where Davey is at all? No. Opt out? Yeah. Um, I'm about to start a lecture, but afterwards I can hop in. Okay, I'll, okay? I'll just catch up with you after your lecture. Sounds great. Or during the break. Oh, yeah, or during the break. During the break. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Do you know if Hafiz is yeah, doing sure. a lecture today? You uh, can check the calendar sector. Do you want me to just quickly check for you? Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Uh, week four, day three, it's Ajax yeah, intro. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, sorry about that, guys. We'll start up now. Um, Calgary will be lecturing themselves today, so we're not waiting on them. 
The topic of today's lecture is Ajax. We're keeping right along with our front end development theme. Uh, we had CSS earlier this week. What did you guys have yesterday? jQuery. Uh, so we'll be using some jQuery tools today as well and learning about this new thing, uh, Ajax. So Ajax, maybe not the greatest of names. Uh, in practical terms, what it helps us to do is to do HTTP, HTTP requests in our browser uh, asynchronously. I will learn in a second that it stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, we are going to be looking at what is the browser's relation to Ajax, what is the use case for using Ajax, uh, do we need to think about fallbacks, uh, meaning if Ajax is not supported in a particular case, what are our backup plans. We're going to look at what are the responses we can get from an Ajax HTTP request, and we're going to briefly touch on something called cores. Uh, but first to start off, we already, <laughs> Ajax isn't this guy. It stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, and I just said it practically helps us to do asynchronous HTTP requests within the browser. So today's lecture isn't so much learning a new concept. It's taking a concept that we already understand and finding a new way to use it. Uh, we're, we're revisiting our good old friend uh, HTTP requests and we're bringing it new life. Ajax itself is the combination of a browser object called the XML HTTP uh, request object and client-side JavaScript and HTML. We won't be interfacing with this object directly in this lecture. Uh, it's a little bit too lo low level for us. Practically, as web developers, we usually abstract it uh, one layer higher. In our case, we're going to be working with jQuery to send Ajax requests. There's also a built-in uh, native fetch request that you can do with all modern browsers. Uh, you, you can build an HTTP AJAX request right off of this object. It requires a little more steps, um, but it is possible. Before we start with the demo, let's just look at what the difference between an AJAX request is and maybe a traditional request that we would have seen uh, up until this point. So here on Wikipedia, as I'm scrolling through the site, if I want to go, oh look, there's a nice category on arts. I click on this link, it takes me to the page. But when that happens, we see a page reload. It's, it's fairly fast, but any of my navigation triggers uh, a refresh of the page, and we get new content loaded. This would be very similar to how you guys handled uh, different pages and routes with your Tiny app. Um, when I clicked on the link to edit a short URL, what happened on your guys' side with Tiny app? Sorry, could you repeat that? Mm -hmm. mm. So you're asking that as a question, like in terms of the difference between doing it this way and doing it asynchronously, or you're just saying that that was a step that you had to take or a tiny app to know the page count. Um, we'll look at that to some degree a bit later, um, and maybe I can clarify your question during the break. 
But for now, let's just think about with TinyApp, we had an, a, a link click on the front end, which triggered an HTTP request to our back end. Our back end with Express you know, sorted through which route was applicable for that request. And then it did kind of two things. It found the relevant data for that request. And then it decided which template, and we were using EGS templating, to return to the user along with that data. Uh, but the important part is that our back end took the template and the data, combined them together, and then sends back uh, what we would call a static asset to the front. A static HTML page with information in it, um, a static set of stylings through CSS, and maybe images and, and so forth. Uh, we had a very distinct one cycle, one response, and all of the information needed for the client was uh, on the front end. The same thing is happening here with Wikipedia. They probably have a little more complex of a back end, but when I click on a route, there is a request. They are finding the data, and they are returning me uh, the data and that template combined together in a single page. Whereas if I come to something like Reddit, and it's always a gamble opening Reddit because we want to make sure there's some nice wholesome uh, posts here. Uh, here's some nice history memes. Uh, if I click on this, we don't see a page refresh. We also don't necessarily see a new page. The way this is handled is kind of like a pop-up. But if I click on the subreddit itself, uh, we kind of do see a full new template for the page. Uh, I now have a bunch of new content. But if I go back, you will notice that when I click on this link, we don't have a page refresh. So we're getting a whole new set of data from our server, also a whole new kind of template without needing a page refresh. And this is the fundamental difference between Reddit, which is using asynchronous HTTP requests, or AJAX, and something like Wikipedia, which is using kind of good old-fashioned HTTP uh, requests that we've seen. So the first benefit we're just seeing from this example is that we can have uh, what is known as a single page application. One page that dynamically gets new uh, templates and new information or data when it is needed from the user. So to look at this, we are going to make an application of ourselves. I have a directory here called code. I'm going to make three folders, one index.html, another style.css, and a third app.js for all of our client-side JavaScript. In the index page, we'll run through making a basic skeleton for the page. I have my HTML tags, my head tag, where I can include all the metadata and external resources that I need. Uh, I want one script, uh, which will come from app.js. I also want to link in a style sheet. So here, when I'm defining a link, I have the attribute rel, which stands for relationship. And I'm saying the relationship of this resource that I'm linking to this page is that it's a style sheet. I also need to give it the path to find this style sheet, and that was style.css. Uh, lastly, I said that we're going to be continuing working with jQuery, so we also need jQuery. jQuery is an external library, but what that means is it's just a large JavaScript file itself. I could download that file and put it into my local project and include a local script link to it. I can also use something called a CDN. So if I look up jQuery CDN, CDN stands for Content Distribution Network, I believe. And it is just a hosted uh, path for that JavaScript 
script. I will choose jQuery 3. I'm going to choose the minified version. And it gives me kind of exactly the script tag that I need to import jQuery from this kind of remote location. So I will copy that and paste it in above my application script because my application script will be using uh, the jQuery library. Before we go further, what have you guys learned so far about the location of script that you're loading in? Or where should you load in script on your HTML page? Or does it matter? Is it, are these things that we've thought of at this point? Yeah, at the end is a nice place. So we could move this here. Uh, well, we don't have a body tag. So I'll add a body tag to make it a little more obvious. Uh, what would the reason be for including the scripts after our body? Yeah, exactly. If I'm including my scripts here, uh, this HTML page will be loaded linearly or from the top to the bottom. We will hit these script tags and my document will attempt to fetch those scripts and also initially attempt to run them. If these are big scripts, we can notice like a noticeable maybe delay when the user hits the page. So the idea is can we just render or show content as fastly as possible uh, so that the user doesn't have to wait for any of these scripts to either load or run. There's another option besides putting it after the body, and that's to use some new keywords that we have. One is defer, and the other is async. Defer will function very similar to putting the script tags after the body. You're just telling the document when it hits this line not to load this script right, right away, but to wait until all of the HTML and static assets have rendered and then begin to load and run those scripts. So we could add defer here. I could also add defer here. The other option was async. Async tells the browser to try and load this script asynchronously along uh, the same time that it's loading the HTML content of the page. So it'll try and do it in parallel. And then only when this script is finished loading will it switch execution over to running that script itself. For our case, we're just going to leave it with defer. And alternatively, we could put both of these scripts after the, the body. Uh, seeing as this is kind of a week focused on front end development, I thought we could go through setting up the HTML and CSS of our application as opposed to me skipping over it. Um, I'm not going to go super in detail, but we'll get the flow of what HTML tags we need to set up, what we want to build, and what CSS we're going to use to style it. And at this point, we actually haven't talked about what we're going to be making. Uh, I thought for today's lecture, it might be nice to make one of these like a Pokedex that makes Ajax requests to dynamically find uh, which Pokemon we're searching for so that we don't need a page refresh uh, to see like this little guy here. Luckily, there's a really nice API for all things Pokemon. Uh, they've got a ton of things. We'll look at version two from Pokemons to all the berries in the games, contests, encounters, evolutions, items, locations, uh, and all of these things. We're just going to focus on how can we get enough information about a particular Pokemon to show it in our Pokedex. So the one basic route they have is their API path uh, slash Pokemon. And then the option to either include a Pokemon name or a Pokemon ID or number. In their database's case, they are uh, the same. So the first Pokemon 
is Bulbasaur, I believe. And it is both the number of that Pokemon and how they've indexed it in their database. So it's the ID as well. Uh, I can also do slash like EV. Wait. E. It doesn't look right. Oh. And get a Pokemon from its name. This is the main route that we'll be using to get information. This, the data that's coming back, we have something on abilities. We're not too worried about that. Forms. We have height, species. Uh, sprites will probably be useful. Here, we have one sprite called front default. If I copy this link, whoop. And just paste it into our browser. Get this little Eevee sprout, sprite. So we want to get this image. The other information we have is just the name. Uh, the other thing I thought would be nice is to get the description. And from my brief poking around the API, it's not included in this base request for Pokemon. But they do have another endpoint called characteristic. And with characteristic, you have to give it the ID. You can't give it a name. So if we do characteristic, uh, we'll check one. This is for Bulbasaur, and his description is he loves to eat. So we have two endpoints. Maybe we'll do two requests asynchronously to get both the name, picture, and description of uh, our little Pokemon guys. So let's look at the maybe UI that we want. These are a little maybe beyond the scope of a small lecture, but we'll probably have the name and image description. We can do maybe a green background for where we're displaying the Pokemon and just the kind of rounded rectangle for the Pokedex itself. So I'm going to create a div. I'm going to give it a class, Pokedex. In the Pokedex, I'll have an H1 that just says Pokedex, maybe. Then we'll have an image. The source for this image will eventually be dynamic. But for now, we will make it just EV sprite. Then I'm going to do an H2, so a smaller title uh, for the name of the Pokemon. We'll have question marks because we don't know it currently. And then lastly, we'll have a paragraph tag that will eventually have a description for this Pokemon. We'll pop over to our styles. Our Pokédex itself will give a width of, maybe we'll do a max width of 400 pixels. I'm going to give it a border radius of 20 pixels, so it has rounded corners. Uh, margin auto, hopefully that will center it. We'll also give it a padding of 20 pixels. And we will want a color on it, a background color. We can pop over and get like a color picker. That's not bad. I'll copy the hex here. The other three elements that we had within our HTML was an H1, an image, a H2, and a P tag for a paragraph body. We'll look at styling the image itself. We'll give it a width of 100%, so it should just take up as much horizontal space as it can. Height-wise, we'll do auto. What this means is that we'll preserve the aspect ratio of the picture so that it's not like 
squished or deformed. And we will also give it a background color. And this is where I don't have the Pokedex up anymore, but this screen was like a, a faded green color. And we'll also do a border radius, maybe 10 pixels. OK. Our application is small. It just has these three files. Instead of creating like maybe a basic express server to serve them to a client. I am going to serve them with uh, a NPM module called HTTP-server. And this will spin up a very lightweight server that just allows me to make requests to static files um, in whatever directory that I started in. So I'm going to navigate to the code directory where we have the three files, app.js, index, and style. And I've installed, like the step I did before this was to do npm install uh, globally http-server. So I can just go http-server. It is starting on port 8080. And it's serving anything in the root directory that I'm in. By default, it will try and look for something called index, which we have, and serve that to just the, the root path. So coming over here, if I go to localhost 8080, we get our little Pokedex with our default EV in it right now. Of course, he's a, a static asset at this point. There's nothing about the application so far that makes it dynamic. Uh, we're just kind of serving one route, a slash, to our server, and it's just giving us back the index.html. To make it dynamic, we're going to hop over in our app.js. We'll be using jQuery. And we're using jQuery on elements in our index page. So the div, the h1, image, h2, all of these things. So we only want to run our script after they've been rendered to the page. So that's our motivation for doing document.ready. Oops. And in here, we are going to make one function to make that Ajax request. We could maybe call it get Pokemon. It will take in one maybe search parameter. And we want this search parameter to kind of be general because the API can take in a, uh, a number or an ID or a name. So we'll kind of respect that in our search and allow the user to use e either. And we want a second function, um, maybe update Pokédex, that given a new Pokémon will update our HTML to have the correct information. The last thing I'm going to do before jumping into these functions is to declare a URL kind of constant variable so that we don't have to rewrite our API URL every time we need to use it. So I'll copy that there. Paste it. And in our get Pokemon, to make an asynchronous JavaScript an XML request, we can use our dollar sign to reference jQuery and then use a method called Ajax itself. Uh, there's a couple ways we can use the Ajax uh, function. One is to pass it an initial parameter 
um, config string. We'll give it a URL and the URL that we want to go to. In our case, it's going to be our default path and then plus the particular API route that we want to use. So here, we wanted to get the Pokemon slash whatever data the user gives. So Pokemon slash five in this case would return, who is this guy? Charmeleon. So base path, uh, we don't need the slash because it is here already. Pokemon slash, and then this is our variable information. Eventually will come from the user search. The Ajax method or function returns a promise. So we can handle it with a dot then. And it will return to us the response from our request. So just to test it out, let's console log the response. And let's call our function with just some test uh, data. Get Pokemon. Anyone have a particular number they're interested in? 65. So saving this. This will run on load. It will not update our HTML yet, but if we look in the console, our hope is that, oh no, we don't see anything. So my first test is, am I loading the script properly? Uh, I thought I reloaded the page. Maybe the server took a second to update the files that it was serving. So yes, this thing is in fact on, and the information we are getting back is the same information that we saw earlier from the Pokemon API. We have abilities, all of these pieces of information. The ones we're concerned with, oh nice, it was Alakazam, are the name and the sprite. And even though this is happening uh, kind of on page load, it is in fact dynamic. Uh, one tool that we can kind of play around with is the network tab of developer tools. Have you guys used this network tab much up to this point? A little bit? Yeah, it can be super handy. Uh, we have all of these tabs here, or I guess sub-tabs, all XHR, JS, CSS, so we can filter what uh, requests that we're making. So if we're just loading a CSS page, we can see all the CSS pages that we're getting, or image, or media. Uh, XHR, so we saw that back in our notes, the way we were making, oh, making AJAX requests was with this XML uh, HTTP request object. And over here, uh, that is very much related to this S XHR tab. So if we're making AJAX requests and we want to specifically think about AJAX requests, we can click on the S XHR. Uh, we can also just leave it all. Uh, this was not open, so, oh no, I, we do have the one request here. So we made a request to the Pokemon API with the information 65. This is the response that we got back and the header information. If I refresh it again, we can kind of see a better representation because in the initial, uh, clear it, refresh.
yeah, again, it happens so fast that it isn't really asynchronous at this at this point. We, it's happening at. Do we have a time? Here we go. At seventeen milliseconds. Which to me doesn't make sense because it says our app is coming in at 39 milliseconds, which is where we're running our script from. So this doesn't seem accurate. Or maybe I'm reading it wrong. But let's get it so that it is truly dynamic. It doesn't happen right on the load. We want to map this get Pokemon to a user action. The user action that we can do is to maybe make a form on our Pokédex so that someone can type in a name or a number and then have that trigger the HTTP request. So I'm quickly going to throw up the form here. It will have one input uh, of type text. The name will be, this is the search. I guess it will have two inputs, but the second one is going to be a submit, so a button. So we can send off this form request, and we will just say search. So we don't need the name within the tag. We can assign it to the value, and that should give us search. What happens right now if I put something in and hit this search button? Nothing, or maybe I get a little refresh. So the default action for an HTML form is to send a post request. It might be sending it just to like the root. Mm, I'm not sure what the default path is for sending a request, but it still is triggering or trying to send data somewhere. So we get a refresh, uh, which kind of defeats uh, the purpose of our search. If we want this to happen without a page refresh and dynamically, we don't want, uh, obviously, it to page refresh. To fix that, we can come over to our JavaScript. I'm going to create a listener on the form tag. For one, it is submitted. Any of these HTML uh, events or DOM events so we have on submit, maybe on click, uh, on blur, different actions that the browser and the HTML DOM are like looking out for. So we have a form submit when you click the uh, input button for a form. If you just had a normal link or even a normal DOM element, you can attach a listener for when you click on that thing. Uh, there, there's a bunch of them. But for any of these events that can be triggered, you can attach a listener with jQuery or other JavaScript. And that function will only run when that event is triggered. And not only that, you have access to an event object, which has information about the event that just happened, uh, or the event that is going to happen. So in our case, we want to take this event that is happening, and we want to go prevent default. So we're saying, I know form, you normally like to you know, do a page re refresh and try to submit something. Don't do that. We're going to do something else instead. So now if we type in this form and hit search, absolutely nothing happens, uh, which is nice in our case. So tracking what we want to do next, we want to now search for a Pokemon with Ajax. 
we can use the function that we created, get Pokemon, and we want to pass it some data from the user. We have this input, which should have been you know, some search information from the user. Uh, there's a couple different ways that we could try and find the value or what the user has put in here. Uh, the way I'm going to do it for now is just to give it an ID. We'll call it search. So we have one uniquely identifiable search input. So I can be confident on this side when I go const search equals, we're using the jQuery to grab our search element. And then from that, I want to get the value. I can know that this is finding just a single input and giving me a single value. Passing this value down to get Pokemon should then trigger our Ajax request and just give us a simple console log uh, to the console. Get rid of our test stuff. Save. Give two refreshes. And we'll try Pikachu. Search. Uh oh. And we got nothing. Again, we'll throw in some console logs to test. Are we getting here? Here? Fresh. Text. Oh, was that a refresh I saw? It was. Did I, I deleted it? Uh, so embarrassing, but we'll write this again. Prevent default. Search, there we go. And we're getting information back on Pikachu. If we type in another number, we get another set of data returned on that Pokemon. So we'll try and update our UI in a second. But before we go forward, we've kind of got the basic workflow of uh, an Ajax request, an asynchronous request. Any questions on how we've handled this request? Or any questions on what the request is doing? Any mystery around Ajax at this point? Uh, yeah, at this point. Cool. Uh, yes. For sure. So we want to look at get Pokemon. Uh, we define it as a function. It takes in one parameter. And just behind the scenes, we decided that search would be either a number or Pokemon name. We are doing dollar sign dot. This is kind of equivalent to going the jQuery library dot Ajax. So from the jQuery library, we're using a function called Ajax. Uh, the function Ajax takes in, if we look at the documentation, which we can in a second, uh, there's a different ways we can pass parameters to it. But the most basic one is to pass kind of like a configuration object. And this configuration object takes in a few key value pairs, uh, one of them being the URL that we want to make the request to. We can also pass it like the uh, method. So in our case, we are making a get request. The default Ajax uh, HTTP method is get. But we're not re restricted to doing only get requests with Ajax. We have you know, access to our whole range of uh, get, delete, put, post, and the ones that we've started to become comfortable with. Uh, but in our case, we can leave it as the default, and we don't need that extra parameter. 
we can also set stuff about like headers. If we had a particular header information that we need to um, detail in our request. Once we've given Ajax the configuration object, uh, it will asynchronously try to accomplish that request. Because this is an asynchronous function, we need to handle it in an asynchronous way. And we've seen a few different ways of handling asynchronous methods at this point, one of them being callbacks, the other one being promises. Uh, in the case of Ajax, it wants us to handle it with promises. So at some point, Ajax is promising us that it will return uh, the HTTP request, or it will return that it like, couldn't finish the request. So we're doing a dot then to wait until that promise is returned. And if it's successfully returned, we will run this callback function in our dot then that takes the response and logs it to the console. We are also going to do a couple other things in the dot then eventually to make sure that it updates our UI uh, and maybe even to have it do a second request to get the Pokemon description and things. Exactly. I mean, you would think you could do the dot catch, uh, but for some reason, jQuery doesn't play by the same rules as everyone else. And they have decided to replace dot .catch with a dot .fail. Uh, functionally, it is the same thing. When this request fails, it will be triggered. I, it frustrates me a lot. Um, I haven't done any research into why there's the difference in convention. I could maybe look that up over the break, but yeah. We great point because we do want to have a handling of the case when our AJAX request is not successful. If there's no more questions right away. We will go to a break for 15 minutes. Uh, it's 10:47 now, so that makes it a little awkward. We'll come back at 11:03, uh, two around there. Oh, uh, the thing I forgot to do, do you guys find it helpful when we use um, CodeCast? Because our, our project's getting a little bit bigger. I'll probably set up CodeCast and throw the link to you guys so when you come back, or maybe I'll do it right now. So if you, you want to poke around in the code during the break, you can.
So where we left off, we had just created our Ajax request to the Poke API to dynamically get a Pokemon's name and sprite. And we have it currently console logging uh, to the console, but we don't have our uh, UI updating at all. So that was our next maybe goal. We have a shell of a function called update Pokedex. And the idea here was to take in a Pokemon object. And we could decide at this point what that Pokemon object looks like. But it would probably look in the form of name, some name, uh, image, uh, some image, path, and then probably a description. So if we're expecting this to be the input that we receive, this might be a good place to start. We want to update our image tag, our h2 tag, and our p tag. So we're going to use jQuery to grab each of those tags one at a time. So the first tag we're going to grab, we're going to limit it just to the Pokedex. And as a child of the Pokedex, we can grab the image. Uh, we want to change an attribute of the image tag. We're not changing text or anything. Specifically, we want to change the source. So we can use this function, dot attribute. We pass it which attribute we want to change, source. And then what we want to change it to, well, we are hopeful that eventually Pokemon will have an image uh, key and value to it. Next, we can go similar pattern dot Pokedex. We will grab the H2, which is currently where we're thinking of storing the name. We will set the text of that H2 to be the new Pokemon dot name and finally we'll go dot pokedex the paragraph tag same thing dot text and we will set it to the new pokemon dot description and those are the three things that we need to do uh, we could test this before we try and integrate it with the other function just to make sure that our logic is is going well and we'll update Pokedex. We'll pass it in that Pokemon object with a name. We know our uh, default picture is Eevee with a image. Uh, we could go over, copy that image. And then we can make up a description for now. One fluffy guy. So on reload now, we do have all, it may, maybe it would have been more dramatic if we had chose a different image so we could see the change, but we are changing the image, the name, and the title. So next we want to link these two together so that an update Pokedux happens when we fetch or get a new Pokemon place that would make sense is somewhere in here. Maybe we want to do update Pokemon. But we don't currently have that Pokemon object to pass it in. We have a response object that has a whole whack of information. But we need to extract from that both the name and the sprite. So if we look through this object, these are all our first, first level keys. One of the first level keys is, in fact, name. So we should be able to just go response.name. One of the first level keys is sprites. But sprites, it looks like, is a nested object. So inside sprites, no. <laughs> I don't know why it's not opening. Uh, but we can see part of it. Let's try again. Well, sprites, maybe we'll check on the Poke API site. 
Sprites is an object that has a bunch of keys of its own, defining what type of sprite uh, is associated with that. So we have their back, uh, we have shiny, we have front. For now, we'll go with front default. So navigating from the root of this object, this would be our response. We want to go response dot sprites into the sub object dot front default to get our sprite. Should be response dot sprites dot front default. And the name should be response dot name. But we'll check to make sure that we're grabbing them correctly. Test and sprite and name. Clear this. We'll do a new request to 23. Test. It's a little bit hard to see, but we do have test and then a looks like an image link, and Ekans. So we have the ingredients, time to put it all together. The direction I'm going to go is to initialize our Pokemon object outside of the request, Pokemon, and give it some default values. So that if any point during our request flow, we are not able to get a name, description, or image, we can kind of revert to the defaults. So name, our default, will just be question marks. Our description will be unknown. And our default image, actually a better default name and image would be this guy. And then we can head over here and look up Maybe this one. Who who knows the story of missing no? Yeah? What is what is this thing? Where does it come from? We want to give a brief description. Comes back from I, I think Pokemon Red and Blue. Uh, there was like a particular island you could surf around and this, you can encounter this Pokemon, the, where's a battle? Oh, they don't have an image here. Oh, yeah, here. So it looked like this. A wild missing no appeared. And just a glitch in the game, uh, Poke Pokemon were the same way our API is indexed by ID. They were indexed from 1 to 151 or something. And when the game tried to look for a Pokemon outside of that range, uh, the error was missing number. And the sprite that they tried to fetch for it ended up just grabbing a bunch of other game data that didn't correspond well to an image. And so you got this like jarbled uh, missing number guy. But super appropriate for our default data, because if we can't find anything, it's kind of the same thing. We have a missing number or missing Oh, that's a huge image link. Whoa! That, I don't know if that's going to work well. We'll see. We might have to replace it. Oh, that's definitely not what we need. Uh, let's see. Grab this. Copy image address. There we go. Much more manageable. Uh, so we have the unknown, missing no. And then as we're receiving data back from our server, we can overwrite the defaults if we're successfully getting stuff. So here is where we could go Pokemon.image is going to equal the sprite. Pokemon.name will equal the name. We don't have a description here, so we'll just leave it to the default. And then we will go update. Pokédex with our Pokemon. 
And in the case that we get a fail, we can also update Pokédex with Pokémon, and then we'll just use the default stuff. It's looking good. Let's test it out. What's the number suggestion? And you're you're not you're limited by like we're in the thousands now, so we don't have to stay. We can. 530. Let's see what that guy is. Oh, this, it's Excadrill, the famous Excadrill. <laughs> this guy looks pretty cool. So we, we have it updating. Uh, I don't know, if we throw something that's like clearly not a Pokemon, I'm not sure how the API is going to respond. If it does do a fail, we will maybe get our default stuff. Nice. So if we give it something real, we get real data back. If we give it something out of the range, we do get our uh, missing number guy. Oh, no, that's not out of the range. We need to go big. There we go. So we have our success case, our fail case. We also now want to think about getting that description from the second API. And we're, we're going to look at how to chain to uh, AJAX requests. Because we're doing them dynamically, we're not you know, like limited to a single request or a single data fetch. We can, you know, based on the user flow and based on how the other requests are performing, we can make further requests to uh, add more data. So we'll follow the same pattern. Once we have received the Pokemon image and name, we're going to do another request to characteristic. So this one was, yeah, characteristic. The only thing this time is we are forced to use a number. So from our Pokemon thing, we will want to grab the ID and use that for our next query. Because the one case where we couldn't just use our search parameter is if someone puts in an actual Pokemon's name. So characteristic, and then we're going to get the response and use the ID from the response to link on a second uh, asynchronous request. Here, we have a second promise being added. We could just chain on a dot then here and handle our promise, getting back our descript or characteristic. Something like this. Oops. Like that. And then in here, we could update our, our Pokedex. But what was the main point of using promises? What problem did it help us to get around? Yeah, nesting different asynchronous things, uh, which we called callback hell. Uh, we only have two asynchronous requests now, so we're not quite in hell. But if we were to continue this and we had to do more and more requests, uh, we could get that like nested structure. So. When we have multiple asynchronous things, we still need maybe to make this AJAX request after this one because we need to know the ID. So we do need to start it within the then block. But to avoid this nestedness, what we can do is we can return the promise and then add this dot then. Uh, after the first dot then. So we have one dot then, which returns a promise, and then a second dot then. Uh, with our promise chain, a subsequent dot then will pick up uh, where the previous dot then left off, meaning whatever this then returns is what this then is, is trying to get from its uh, callback function. 
So if we returned just the number 5, the number 5, uh, this dot then would have characteristic of 5. And this is not an asynchronous thing, so this dot then would be triggered right away. But if we are returning a promise, uh, this is smart enough to know, OK, I just got a promise. I will wait until that promise resolves to run the, dot, uh, the callback associated with this dot then. That way, we still stay kind of like one level deep within our requests or within our asynchronous promises. Um, and this fail, or in the better case of when we're using a catch, will handle any failure or any uh, promise rejection throughout the promise chain. So if we make one promise, uh, it succeeds. We make a second promise, and that one fails. We still have the option of using a single catch to get it. If we have a whole string of promises like 7, 8, 10, any point along that promise chain, uh, we can use one fail to catch it. So we have, at this point, we are thinking we have a characteristic. We're going to do Pokemon dot description is going to equal our characteristic. This will be a response object, so we're going to have to look back at our data to kind of poke around and see what is returned. We have at the root level something called descriptions, which seems to be an array. And in descriptions, uh, no. In descriptions, we have two. We have the first thing in the description being an object that has two keys, a description and a language. And the second thing in descriptions following the same format uh, with the description and the language. Uh, so we have French and English. We want to get the uh, English one which is the second uh, key here, but won't be for all of them. Because I think I've done some poking around. Hmm. Maybe they fixed it. My worry was that some Pokemon don't have the French description. They only have the English. So if we look for description number or index number one or description number two, we'll get an error sometimes. I'm not finding any counterexamples to support that, but maybe we'll protect against it anyways. So instead of saying uh, second description, we could loop through it and look for the description that matches English, or we can just say the last description just to keep it maybe naive but simple for now. So it was characteristic dot descriptions. And then that's an array. And we want to get the last thing in that array. There's a couple ways we could do this. One is to go dot descriptions dot length minus 1. And from the particular description that we're getting, remember they have both a description and language key. We want to get the description value from it. Let me just. So from the characteristic, we're getting all the descriptions. We're finding the length of the descriptions and minusing one to get the last description. And then we're getting the description uh, to go along with that. And then we're updating the Pokedex if we can. We'll check. Oh, nice. 
for the Charmander. And nice. He's highly curious. Look at this curious little guy. Uh, the one problem is I'm pretty sure their API is like, I guess, not complete. Because if we put in a characteristic for like an ID above, I think it's like 30. So if I go 40, we just get nothing. Apparently, they've only inputted stuff up to and including 30, 31, we get nothing. So luckily, we, we're handling errors in a smart way. If we go 40, I don't think we should break, but we just get an unknown description. So that's kind of thanks to our promise chaining. Uh, sweet. Any questions on how we are chaining to asynchronous requests, or I guess on the application in general? Nice. I think we're going to have a little bit of time towards the end to add on one or two bonus features to this. But at the, at the moment, it's, it's maybe like round one minimum viable product to Pokedex. Uh, what's someone's favorite Pokemon? Squirtle. All these, all these like Pokemon descriptions just make them seem like lazy. Takes plenty of siestas. The other one was like loves to eat. <laughs> just like. Awesome. Uh, so we'll probably come revisit this, but let's do a review, uh, more conceptual side of things of Ajax. So we were using Ajax. Ajax is something that is universally supported across all browsers. It's not like an external library thing like jQuery is. It's built directly into browser client-side JavaScript. We talked about that XML HTTP request object. And if I open up the console here and I type in XML HTTP, I see this HTTP request object. And I can do things like all of these things, headers received, loading, opened, uh, bind, call, some of those are not specific to an HTTP request object. But we could use these methods to do an AJAX request the same way that we were using jQuery. Uh, it's a little more syntactically tedious than using jQuery. There's also another built-in function in browsers called fetch. Fetch is very similar to the jQuery Ajax that we used. And it was just like, a hey, people don't really like using the uh, XML HTTP request object. Let's provide a native or um, a browser supported fetch that makes it easier for people. So not everyone needs to use something like jQuery. So you can look around and see how fetch works uh, for the most part. And this week, you'll be using jQuery to do your AJAX, but fetch is another option. This is like a pointless screen on what browsers are used in the world. But uh, we're going to start exploring some maybe cons with using AJAX. Not all of them are hard cons and that they can't be resolved. But the first one is to think that when we're navigating through sites on uh, the internet, our browser is tracking our history. Uh, this can be very helpful at times when we want to go back or like look through our history tab. Um, with AJAX, you lose some of the history that your browser provides. You lose the ability to go back and forward. Our, our thing here is it, we're not really getting a new page. so. Like if I wanted to go back to Squirtle, uh, it just goes back to the start of the page. So we lose, and if I want to go forward to the one that I was doing again, we don't really get that. Uh, also, if I wanted to have different paths for my page, I wanted to go localhost 8080 slash Squirtle. Um, my host is, or my server is not set up to do that anyways. 
but it, even if it were, there's a single route that serves our single page application that has no difference between different routes uh, of our page because routes was a thing that when we did tiny app was a full request to the server to serve a different template depending on the route. So by default, we lose both the back and forward history and pathing for different pages when we have a single page application. That doesn't mean we can't uh, kind of resolve that or, or solve that issue. The browsers have a history API that can, you can use to edit and update and keep track of the history yourself. But it's just extra work when you're building a single page application so that when we maybe make a new AJAX request, we also push to the history object to say, hey, we're going to a new page. Uh, if the user tries to go back, just send them to this version of the single page application. So same way uh, we could go HTTP request object or fetch, we have this history object in the browser. Uh, we have the ability to go back, go forward, to see the length of uh, the current history object. So how many times can we go back? Uh, the state. And we can use this object to update and you know, artificially create our own uh, history. That solves problem one. Problem two is thinking about the pathing, so slash Squirtle. Uh, it's also a problem we can fix. We can use the browser to access what pathing is happening after the base URL and tell it to like either server side, tell it to not do a refresh for those new paths. Uh, and client side, we can take those paths and have them do different AJAX requests or different data fetches for our client. That's a bit beyond the scope of, of Twitter for this week. Uh, later, when you're using tools like React, which provides a framework around which to do single page applications, it becomes much easier to handle different pathing and things. So all that just to say that these are two issues that do come up when we're doing asynchronous requests but they are resolvable, just not maybe immediately with the tools that we have available right now. I included a little link here if you want to look at some of the ways you can use the history API. So we build our cool application. Maybe we saw some reasons or ways that it improved on maybe a static page. Uh, but what are the reasons overall to use something like Ajax? Any, before we look at, maybe you saw it, what are some reasons that we can think of off the top of our head for uh, a single page application or AJAX requests uh, as a piece of technology? If you saw it, it's okay. You can, you can say the ones you saw as well. SBAs, what do SBAs stand for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I already said the term SBAs is just shorthand for a single page application. So it was like Reddit that we looked at. It's one page, no refreshes between the different data that we can receive. What else is kind of nice about an asynchronous uh, HTTP request? Yeah, you don't need to load the whole page. Sometimes there's cases where, like our application, you just want to update or change a small part of your uh, application. And it's unfortunate to have to do a full request and response in order to achieve that. Not only does it maybe break the user's kind of flow of using the application, in that if I'm scrolled to the bottom and I do refresh, it might jump me up. I might notice the, the reload. There's all these different things. But it's also more costly to do a full uh, page refresh and request of template information, images, CSS, HTML, when all we really needed in our case here was just three points of data. It's lighter to do a small data request than it is to do a full page reload. Some of the other benefits are, so we saw single page applications, performance, performance in the sense that we just talked about, we don't need to do a full request of everything. The other way um, AJAX affects performance is that we can distribute the data loads that we need for an application throughout the use of that page. 
Meaning, if we have something, again, maybe like Reddit, where there could be you know, thousands of posts, if we have a static page, we have to decide on the first load of this page, how many posts do we uh, uh, load in? Is it like a couple thousand? Then that's a really intensive initial like, request to get all of that data. Where Reddit, as you scroll, it, I mean, it's pretty fast, but it knows when you're getting to the bottom and it just loads in asynchronously more content. So instead of the user having to wait a long time at the start to get all in all of this information, it is distributed throughout the, the use of the application to small requests here and there instead of a big request right at the, at the beginning. There are cons of using uh, asynchronous requests as well. One big one being that accessibility with dynamic content is tricky. So when I'm talking about accessibility, I'm thinking about things. In general, the concept is how do we make and design websites that are accessible uh, to everyone regardless of your ableness. One big thing with websites is how do I make a web page screen reader friendly? With a static page, it's, it's fairly easy to have, it is easier at least to have it screen reader friendly that we can label with like images with alt tags and, and the text is you know, laid out in a standard form. With asynchronous pages, the page itself is always changing. New information is being added and that just inherently makes it harder for a screen reader to know or accurately describe what is happening on the page. Again, it's not a problem that's like not uh, fixable, but it, it is harder than a, a standard page and is something that we as developers should think about. Uh, secondly, asynchronous programming patterns are just like more complex to code. We got a little bit of an idea of it maybe even just with our two asynchronous requests here. This promise chain is more complex than a basic route on an express server would be. This requires a little bit deeper understanding of asynchronous patterns, things like promises, than an express server would. It requires JavaScript and XML HTTP request support. So if we don't have either of those for our asynchronous application, everything is going to break unless we have some fallbacks. This browser object is, was not in existence forever among browsers. It, at this point, is fully supported. So unless someone is using like a super old Internet Explorer browser that is not supported by Internet Explorer anymore, it has refused to update it, you're going to be pretty safe on this end. But there are still all cases where people just disable JavaScript uh, in their browsers themselves. They are opposed to JavaScript running on any of their pages, and that might be something we need to think about if we are making a site that heavily relies upon JavaScript to do data loads and fetches and things. And then the last one is that history is not automatically supported. We kind of talked about that briefly. So to that second last point, if JavaScript or the XML HTTP request object may in some cases not be supported, uh, what do we do? JavaScript is supported across all browsers. XML, HTTP request is supported across all browsers. You can always check out uh, can I use to see what browser coverage there is. So fetch is the one implementation of that request object. It has a little bit less support. So if you're particularly using fetch, you, this may be relevant to you. If you are just going to use the base request object, its support is like universal at this point. These grayed out ones don't exist anymore. So but even if it's supported, users can disable it. And there are some maybe arguments for disabling JavaScript. If you have very poor bandwidth, and that can happen in a lot of parts of the world. Disabling JavaScript can greatly increase your speed and decrease the bandwidth that you are using on your network. 
It can help with usability and accessibility. Uh, that's what we talked about with like, things like screen readers. If you disable JavaScript, uh, it's, it's easier. Your screen readers will have an easier time. And lastly, sometimes people disable JavaScript for security reasons. And you might be thinking, well, how, how is JavaScript, client-side JavaScript, a security risk? It only runs within the context of the browser. It isn't given free reign on the computer. Uh, I guess the answer is people are really creative and always find ways to break stuff. Uh, with client-side JavaScript, like one example, even here, in this form, you see like the suggestions coming up. And these suggestions are based on this input's name. So this input, I've named it search. So any inputs across my browser that have the same name as search will have these same suggestions. One exploit that was done a while ago was to hide inputs within the HTML of a site that was served. So it's, it's not visible, but it's there. And to cycle through different names or the input bar, things like email, password, uh, and so on and so forth. Passwords that have a type password obviously don't have a suggested uh, suggestion list, but you can still extract a bunch of information like email, uh, username from that person just by knowing what their other suggestions are. Uh, in a similar way, if you take a link and you hide it in the page and you change that link like it's an A tag, to be linking to all different sites. If I have a, where's a nice standard? No, those aren't. You have a standard link, vanilla, on your page, and you have gone to that link before, it's changed color, right? You have a blue link for something you haven't been to, a purple link for a link that you have visited before. So with client-side JavaScript and HTML and variably changing what that link is to, you can get an idea of that user's history. Uh, both of these may or may not be huge security risks to you. But I guess the point is that there is some motivation behind disabling JavaScript for security and things. Uh, so all that said, what do we do? If we want to make single page applications, if we want to do asynchronous uh, JavaScript requests, if JavaScript isn't enabled, our site will just not work by itself. Uh, we can decide maybe to have versions of our site so that we can test if JavaScript is enabled. Then we serve a static version of the site. Otherwise, we do the dynamic version. We can also choose maybe to use asynchronous stuff only for additional content loads. The initial data comes in served already. Like with the Reddit example, maybe we serve the first 100 posts uh, non-asynchronous, so synchronously. And then if the user wants to get more, we have to provide a different version. Or not a different version, but maybe an, another button that lets them get it by a non-asynchronous way. This might not be the most important thing to do. There's a lot of people who argue that like you just shouldn't have fall, you don't need to have fallbacks for a site that heavily relies on JavaScript because it's so uh, it impermeates the modern web so much that people who disable it kind of know what they're getting into, and that's that's depends on the project and it's up to you. But it is something that you might want to think about when we're starting to use things like Ajax. Lastly, we saw response is from our AJAX requests, but we didn't really talk about them. With our Pokedex one, we console logged the response here in the console, and we also saw it here from the Pokemon API, and it was in a form that we're familiar with, uh, JSON. JSON being very transferable into JavaScript objects, it made it very easy for us to use. But you are not limited to AJAX responses with, or sorry, uh, JSON responses with AJAX. In fact, in the name asynchronous JavaScript and XML, it was originally designed mostly for XML response. XML is another 
way of encoding data. We can look up some XML here. So we have sharp tags and attributes with values. If this looks slightly familiar to HTML, that's a good point. Uh, HTML, in some cases, can be considered a subset of XML. XML has a wider use case than HTML in that you can just send da pure data. The same Pokemon data that we were receiving from our API could have been sent in XML, and in the early web may have been sent in XML. It is not as popular and doesn't, it honestly is not used very much, except for a subset called uh, XHTML, I think it is. XHTML, which is, that's us which looks just like HTML to us, but is done in such a way that it can be sent uh, as XML. So we're doing asynchronous requests. We can be receiving JSON. We could also be receiving XML or kind of HTML as a response. And depending on the architecture or design decisions of your application, you may use both. So with GitHub uh, projects, it's a newer feature with GitHub allowing you to organize repositories and add tasks and similar to like Trello, I guess. If I open up the network tab, limit to XHR, and I go add a new column, new project, and I hit create column. We don't get a page reload, and we see this new DOM element appearing here on the left. Looking at our network, we see a group or a cluster of ex, uh, asynchronous requests that went out. Show progress, header, metadata, and cards. We look at this last one, and we look at the response. Oh, maybe it wasn't cards. Oh, here. All of these ones, actually. Header, metadata, show progress. The response, we'll make it nice and big. Or maybe we won't. Uh, the response is like HTML. It's sent as XML, HTML. And this is directly what is rendered here on the left. In fact, if we click on this, so let's look. This is progress. Let's look at the header. Projects, metadata, render, underscore node. It's not very descriptive, but hopefully we can find Flex row, flex. Maybe it's not the best use of time to search through. But the point is that this is the alternate way to do to get content or data from your server. Uh, if you're very used to a template style of requests and responses, working with something like Express and EJS, this is a way to directly take that same workflow and apply it to asynchronous HTTP requests returning the exact template to render to the page. Uh, GitHub, in this case, receives that and just inserts it or appends it to an existing div within their DOM. The other way to do that would be to say, within, where's our project? Within app.js to build new DOM elements dynamically and fill them dynamically.
one thing to be aware of, and you're realistically not going to have a great understanding, of course, because it is something fairly confusing and can be complicated. Uh, but it is a problem that can come up when we're now open to doing asynchronous requests. CORS stands for Cross Origin uh, Resource Sharing. And to understand CORS, we need to know what a cross origin request is. Origin is the initial server that our client communicates with to get the first data or the first template from the server. So in our case, for our Pokemon application, the origin server is that HTTP server that I am running here, that lightweight server that just returns the index page. That is called the origin. In Tiny App, you only had the one server, that would have been your origin. It's the main server that your client would normally be communicating with. With asynchronous requests, we can now decide to make requests to other servers. With our Pokemon application, I am making a request to the Pokemon API. It's a separate server from the server that gave the initial uh, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. A request to another server would just be called a cross-origin request. I make, I make request origin, and then alternately, I can make a cross-origin request to another domain. The fact that I'm able to make requests to other domains has some security issues around it, or just some extra precautions or thoughts to think about when you're doing it. Uh, one is if we're making requests to a server, they have access to our cookies. If we make a request to another server that isn't the primary server that this client is responsible for, like the relationship between my client and the origin server is fairly safe because that's the server that gave me the initial stuff. I can trust it with giving the cookies that I have for that server because it would most likely have set them. Uh, we have this like sub, uh, we have this like foundation of trust because it is a server that gave me the things. Another domain somewhere out there, I don't necessarily from or my client doesn't necessarily trust to give it all the cookies and things that have now been associated with this origin server. Uh, because of that, cores exist, which is that cross-origin sh resource sharing. It is a set of standards for what is acceptable and what is not as acceptable uh, when you're doing cross-origin requests. Uh, the core standard describes new HTTP headers which provide browsers a way to request remote URLs only when they have permission. Although some validation and authorization can be performed by the server, it is generally the browser's responsibility to support these headers and honor the restrictions they impose. This is one example of a header that you might send in order to make a cross-origin request. You send the request with the header saying, allow all cross-origin things between my client and this other server. In the case of our application, this API has just allowed, on their side, server side, cores requests, so we didn't see that issue. But if they had any sort of cores validation on their side of the server, we would have got an uh, invalid res request response telling us that we needed to validate ourselves with cores. This is something that you might run into later on. So it's good to know that it is a problem that exists now. But it's not something I would encourage you to research more into at this point. Uh, for me, cores is like this boogeyman in the closet that shows up every once in a while. And then I go and frantically research what cores is again and how to solve it. I shove it away into the closet and then kind of forget about it again. Uh, whether or not you want to take the same approach is up to you. But it probably won't be something that you're thinking about uh, day to day. Excellent. Those are all the things I wanted to get over in terms of the concepts behind Ajax. Any thoughts around you know, the best use case, things like fallbacks, cores, any of the stuff that we just went over uh, in relation to Twitter, in relation to Pokedex, 
or just questions in general? Nice. I assume <laughs> we're feeling a little, at least a little bit comfortable with it then. Uh, so maybe no questions is a good sign. But if you do have questions and you're just not wanting to ask them now, um, message me or come find me later. We have a bit of time left over, so let's add at least one bonus feature to our Pokedex. What I was thinking would be cool. Another aspect of the Pokedex is that like, if you haven't found a Pokemon yet, you kind of don't have access to it. So my thought is, if we put it in a number, it would be nice to maybe get just that, like, who's that Pokemon outline, where we can't see the image, we also don't know the name, and we don't know the description. So we can search around, but only if we put in the Pokemon's full name do we get the full set of information. So just on a planning standpoint, that involves looking at the input that the user gives us, testing whether it's a number or whether it's a name, and then updating the UI accordingly. We also want maybe a CSS element to change this image so that it's like obscured. And there's a few CSS image filter things that we can do. A bunch of things like blur, brightness, contrast, drop shadow, grayscale, hue rotation, invert, opacity, uh, saturate, and so on and so forth. We probably could do something with saturate and grayscale as well. But I know if we set the brightness down to zero, it will just be like a black image. So let's test that off. We add a class unidentified to our Pokédex. We'll add another selector where if we have a Pokédex that is also unidentified, the image should have a filter. with a brightness and a value. Oh, the, the value is a percentage. So we'll say brightness 0. And if we refresh our page, mm, that's not good. I thought it would be nice if we actually see, and I can do this. Uh, that's another issue that I don't know if I can fix. But let's, if I remove the background color, does that fix? OK, so we get just the like outline of the guy. I, I, apparently, I can do this, though. So that's, that kind of cheats, but we'll forget about that. Uh, if I still wanted the green, I just have to add another div that the image was inside of. Uh, if we have time, we can do that. But we kind of achieve what we want. So in our application, before the request occurs, I want to test if search is a number or a string. Again, there's probably a few ways we can get this. One is to go is non and pass it in the search. So if it is not a number, then we don't want to apply the filter. But if it is not not a number, so it is a number, we're dealing with double negatives, which is not nice, we want to add the class. And it was to Pokedex, so we can use jQuery to say Pokedex dot add class, and we'll give it undefined. 
No, unidentified. And otherwise, we want to remove the class unidentify. I think that's the correct function. But let's test it out. So if you do a name, uh oh. We do a number. Uh oh. Unidentified. Unidentified. So base one, we do a number. Oh, nice. And if we do the name, it shows up. We still want to somehow get rid of this stuff. This is not the best way to do this, but for the sake of time, we'll just copy the same. the same test and we'll check if it's not a number then we will change the default values otherwise we'll keep the default values we'll do it again when we have the description So now if we do Pikachu, we get everything. But if we do 25, why did the black come back? Uh, Oh, because I'm, I'm also not setting the sprite. So we want to set the sprite regardless, even if it's, if it's not a thing. So 45, there we go. Who is it? Oh. So the, the other like weird thing to our logic is we should probably it flashed before the request even started. So maybe we'll do this. Oh, but the thing is, yeah, the the logic it, it, overall for this uh, unidentified thing is is not great. If we move it down here, then if the request fails, I haven't done the check. So it'd have to you know, go through it a bit better. But now we can do some random number. And then we can go Scyther and get the information back. <laughs> so a little bit of a bonus feature. Awesome. Uh, that is everything that we needed to cover. I will give you these lecture notes. You'll also have access to the code that we did here if you want to poke around and get an idea how we were doing asynchronous requests. Any questions, come find me. I'd love to go through them. Uh, but thank you, and have a good rest of the day.